Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is a Zoom recorded lecture on the topic malicious prosecution or the course law 1511. Okay, so this is the introduction. Okay, so an action for malicious prosecution, usually it is available uh, to those who have been prosecuted maliciously. Uh, what's the meaning of the word maliciously here? Usually, uh, it is malicious okay, whenever the prosecutor had no reasonable and probable cause to, uh, to, 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 do, okay, to proceed with the prosecution in the first place. And then the most important requirement for an action for malicious prosecution is that uh, the plaintiff in malicious prosecution suit has to prove that actually the prosecution has ended in his favor, meaning that here he has won the case in which prosecutor prosecuted him okay, without reasonable and probable cause. Um, and because of that, okay, because of uh, malicious prosecution by the prosecutor, by the party, um, the plaintiff has unfortunately caused, um, I mean, suffer, ha has suffered damage due to the exposure and humiliation he received during the stage of prosecution. Because usually prosecution uh, will involve all those things like uh, humiliation. Okay, uh, plaintiff, uh, it is very embarrassing. Okay? Uh, plaintiff be become, uh, I mean, is considered as being humiliated. So what's the reason or what's the rationale of having uh, the rule or the law on malicious prosecution? So basically, um, uh, the aim, okay, the objective is to discourage the perversion. Okay, perversion is from the word pervert basically, okay, but basically uh, it means uh, abuse, okay, distortion, the corruption. So discourage the abuse of machinery of justice for an impro improper Use. So, as far as possible, we want to avoid those things to happen. We want to prevent a prosecutor or anyone okay, to, uh, to do or to initiate prosecution based on, without any, uh, without um, reasonable or probable cause of action or to actually to avoid the uh, abuse of machinery of justice. And uh, it, it is always the, uh, a question of uh, conflict, conflicting principles, okay? So the duty is imposed on the court, all right, to steer between the two conflicting principles to actually make a proper balance. It, uh, who, who has better right, actually? Okay? Because on one hand, everyone, okay, all of us, both plaintiff and defendant, has the freedom okay, to set the law in motion, to initiate any action, to bring criminals to justice, especially whenever they involve um, uh, criminal action, criminal suit. But on the other hand, there is also a necessity to check okay, the lying accusations against innocent people. Even though the percentage is not that high, but actually there exist okay, um, cases in which innocent people has been convicted. All right? uh, so as far as possible, we want to prevent those things from happening. Okay, we go straight to the elements of malicious prosecution. So basically, there are uh, five important elements uh, for a plaintiff uh, to prove okay, in order for him to be able to uh, follow suit on malicious prosecution. Okay, the first one must prove prosecution and then prove termination of prosecution in favor of the plaintiff for the, as far as the malicious prosecution suit uh, is concerned. The third element is defendant had lacks of reasonable and probable cause to prosecute. And the fourth element is defendant acted with malice, of course, because the topic is malicious prosecution. And number five, very important, plaintiff must prove to the court that he has suffered some damage or losses okay, to, um, I mean, the one that he suffered because of the malicious prosecution. Okay, we go to the first element here, uh, prosecution. So what's the requirement? What's the meaning here? So uh, the requirement is that the case okay, must have reached the prosecution stage and plaintiff must prove that defendant prosecuted him either in criminal prosecution or civil prosecution. Most of the time it is criminal prosecution but sometimes it's also civil prosecution. Okay, let's say if the court dismissed the complaint uh, as disclosing no cause of action, meaning that here unsuccessful attempt by the complainant to set the law in, mo in motion, 
So basically in that particular situation, there's no damage due to the plaintiff in the malicious, malicious prosecution suit. Sorry. I want to, yeah. Uh, would have resulted. So therefore, uh, in that particular situation, if um, uh, if the complainant cannot actually set law in motion, so the case, in such a cases, the case cannot be said to have reached the stage of persecution. So in order for the plaintiff to be able to bring a case of malicious persecution, must prove that um, the case that he has been uh, prosecuted he has reached the stage of Persecution. We are going to look at the leading case of router. Okay, unlike in router case uh, that reached the stage of persecution. So router case actually illustrate, illustrated to us that actually the case has reached that stage of persecution, and uh, the first element is considered as fulfilled. Alright, so this is the case, the judgment by federal court, uh, router and Abdul Karim, 1966. Abdul Karim was prosecuted because Rauter accused uh, him of swearing false affidavit. But Abdul Karim, he later, he was acquitted at trial. And after that, okay, because he was acquitted, meaning that here in a way he won the case. So now he brought the case against Rauter. Why Rauter Abdul Karim? Because this is a field case. All right. So Abdul Karim and Rauter, that's the malicious prosecution action. So, uh, Abdul Karim is plaintiff for the malicious prosecution suit and Rauta is defendant in malicious prosecution suit but in the uh, original case, I mean in the case before that, Rauta is the one uh, who, uh, I mean Rauta is the one who initiated, who caused the case to be brought against Abdul Karim. Uh, be, uh, as far as Abdul Karim is concerned, okay, because of Rauta's statement, he was investigated. Uh, that's the reason okay, why he is suing, he was suing Rauta. Because of Rauter's statement, he was investigated, jailed and prosecuted. And then uh, later, the court held in uh, Abdul Karim's favour. That's why after he was acquitted, so now he proceeded to sue uh, Rauter okay, for malicious prosecution. And at the appeal stage here, okay, uh, the respondent alleged that uh, he was arrested, uh, Abdul Karim basically here, okay, he was arrested at the instance of the appellant. And uh, he was prosecuted on the strength of information supplied by the appellant. Uh, so the, 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 I mean, the offense was actually swearing a false affidavit in a winding up proceeding. But federal court held that okay, it was impossible to hold the appellant was responsible for the prosecution unless it was proved that whatever uh, statement he made to the police were made without belief in, in their truth, for which he had reasonable and probable cause. And the finding of the court is, a, a, is a, um, as well that there was no evidence to make out an absence of reasonable and probable cause on the part of the plaintiff. So the appeal was allowed. Okay, we have a look at another case here, Muhammad Amin and Jogendra Kumar Banerjee. This is a case from India, or reported in All Indian Report, uh, 1947, Judgment by Privy Council. That's why it's relevant to us. So in this case, uh, the magistrate took cognizance, okay, um, uh, recognized, okay, uh, notice, okay, uh, take no took notice of the complaint and the magistrate actually examined the complainant under oath and later um, it was held, I mean the, the inquiry was held in open court under section 202 penal code. And a plaintiff in this, uh, in malicious prosecution later, a plaintiff actually attended and incurred cost of, of defending himself. So the issue is whether this case is considered as has reached the stage of prosecution. So the answer is yes, in affirmative. Yes, this case actually has reached, considered has reached the stage of prosecution. So plaintiff has the right to bring an action for malicious prosecution. We have another case, um, Rosli Bendahlan and Tansri Abdul Ghani Patael. This is quite recent actually, um, 2014. And this is, this is something to do with uh, Attorney General. Uh, this is observation by the court. The court said even the AG, Attorney General of Malaysia, does not enjoy blanket prosecutorial immunity, especially if he has exercised his power in violation of statutory or Constitutional rights. So, uh, constitutionally, actually, everybody is 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 equal. Okay, um, no one is above the law. Okay? In the eyes of law, everybody is equal. Can be brought to the suit. Can be prosecuted. 
So AJ is still subject to judicial scrutiny and the court has to render assistance to the individual who has been aggrieved by that decision. So even AJ can be prosecuted even though in most, I mean in uh, cases, okay, in all cases actually, uh, uh, call, sorry, in criminal cases, AJ is the one who initiate the prosecution uh, by us, I mean, we instructing the uh, public prosecutor to prosecute. So the first element is done, which is prosecution. Okay, the second element which is required to be proved by the plaintiff is termination of prosecution in favor of the plaintiff. Meaning that here, plaintiff in Malaysia's prosecution case has won the case. That's why he has the right to uh, file an action for malicious prosecution. If he has lost the case, so there's no way that he can sue the other party for malicious prosecution. We have the case of a uh, uh, landmark case, okay, uh, common law, 1938. This is decision by House of Law. So it involved two uh, parties here, Smith and Herniman. So both of them actually, they were in business. So they were business uh, friends actually. Both were involved in business. And Herniman used to supply timber to Smith through his driver, Ricketts. So that's basically their business business arrangement. So Smith then received reports from Edgar, who is Edgar here, his worker, that they were paying for more lots than they received. Okay, so they have been receiving supply. Actually, they are, they are receiving lesser compared to the payment that they have made. So Smith brought an action for, uh, against Hanuman uh, for criminal conspiracy to cheat. So, uh, he, uh, so he, he, he decided to bring the case against Hanuman. But however, trial ended in favor of Honeyman. Meaning that here Honeyman was not guilty, was not liable. So now, Honeyman can take action uh, for malicious prosecution against Smith. Okay, that's why we have the, the case is Honeyman and Smith. Still uh, on the same case, but uh, the third element, okay, which is required to be fulfilled by the plaintiff. There must be lacks of reasonable and probable cause for a defendant to prosecute in the first place. So as far as Honeyman and Smith was concerned, uh, the finding was that there was a reasonable and probable cause to prosecute Honeyman and his driver for criminal conspiracy to cheat. And we have another case, common law, uh, Glinsky and McEver, 1962. So McEver, he, he was a police detective. And in this case, actually, uh, he had reasonable and probable cause to prosecute Glinsky for conspiracy to defraud. And actually, this uh, police detective had carried out a series of investigation before um, he decided to proceed with the prosecution. So basically, the third element is not fulfilled for a uh, malicious prosecution action in the case of Galinsky and McEver. Uh, this is local case, uh, Vision Run Ponya and MBF Country Homes and Resorts Number Hut. Uh, and the finding is very obvious here, uh, 202. So the finding of the court is that there was a blatant abuse of court process coupled with malice, abuse together with malice, and total disregard of plaintiff's right. And then, this is the case which illustrates to us, there was no reasonable and probable cause to prosecute at the first place. And then prosecution, whatever uh, earlier action, okay, proceeding, prosecution, caused him so much damage okay, to his reputation as a lawyer of 25 years. So plaintiff in this case, Vijin Ronponya, was a lawyer actually. And when he was being prosecuted, there was no reasonable and probable cause. That's why the prosecution had actually made him to suffer damage, affecting his reputation as a lawyer. So because of that, he won the case in Malaysia's prosecution action here. So he was awarded a total of 400,000 ringgit Malaysia. So 200,000 general damages of his professional reputation. And then 100, uh, 100,000 ring in Malaysia aggravated damages because why? There, there exists malicious intention of defendant. And uh, hun another 100,000 100, ring in Malaysia for the abuse of court process. So altogether, 400,000. So he won the action for malicious prose prosecution against defendant. The fourth requirement is malice. Okay? Um, there must be, okay? it must be proved that defendant acts maliciously. If defendant acted without malice, so there's no way that plaintiff can bring action for malicious prosecution or even if he decided to 
bring it to the court but he cannot win the case for malicious prosecution. So again, uh, here, uh, but then again, proving malice alone is not sufficient because by proving malice alone, it does not show that there was lack of reasonable cause to prosecute because all four elements must be proved together. Malicious, uh, malice is one of the elements. But on the other hand, if lack of reasonable cause is proven, the question of malice or dishonest motive will be irrelevant. So if, if, if the plaintiff proved the third element just now, lack of reasonable cause, basically malice is considered as automatically prove as usual uh, um, as well okay um, but let's say um, the plaintiff prove the no reasonable cause okay and then plaintiff also proves element of malice so what's the what's the significance here proving uh, malice okay? proving malice together with motive okay will tip uh, the skills of liability against defendant so malice is considered as automatically proved but on top of that, motive also can be proved together. So that uh, liability to win the case will be um, heavier. I mean, uh, high probability to win the, case, win the case against the defendant. I give it, I, I provide to you the, um, the difference, okay, the, how to compare motive and malice. So actually you are going to learn in greater detail in your uh, criminal law later. Okay? So motive is the ultimate object. Okay, with which an act is done, the aim, okay, why you are doing, the, why you committed the, the act at the first place. While intention is the immediate purpose. Okay? When act is done with bad intention, it is called malice. So malice in fact refers to performance of an act which may be legal but with ill will okay, or hatred or bad intention. So mal malice is about um, ill will okay, or hatred. But motive is the reason for committing the act. The, the fifth element, the last element to be proved for an action for malicious prosecution is damage. Damage is damage here means refer, I mean it means losses uh, or injuries suffered by the plaintiff. So in, action, in an action for malicious prosecution, plaintiffs must, must prove that the prosecution caused him damage in some way. In here, even though he has proved the, the first four elements just now, but there's no proof of, no evidence of damage that he has suffered, so still he cannot win action for malicious prosecution. So if there is no damage, then the plaintiff cannot bring an action for malicious prosecution. Guess why? It is not actionable per se. Meaning that here, the, the moment it's being committed, uh, you cannot bring the case to the court. You have to prove elements of damage. And this is the last slide. Okay, in the in a very classic case, uh, sixteen ninety eight. This is a common law. Okay, the actually the case is important. Why? This is among the first case in which mal uh, malicious prosecution was established. The first case actually, right? The, the first case ever. And then in this case, the judge, uh, Hall C G, okay, Chief Justice, classified damage for the purpose of this part as three kinds. So there are three uh, kinds of uh, damage. Okay, as far as malicious prosecution is concerned. First, it could be damage to reputation or fame, like the case of uh, the case that we discussed is now is about the lawyer, okay? Or damage to safety to his person, or damage to the security of his property. It could be all the three kinds here. Okay, so that's all for the lecture, the topic for the topic of malicious persecution. So basically, what is uh, what what important for the topic is that. Uh, you must be able to uh, understand okay, uh, all the five elements required for a plaintiff to bring an action uh, for malicious persecution. Yes, sure, yeah. All right, that's all. all right, I'll see you in the final topic okay, later, which is vicarious liability. Okay, until then, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.